Hey everybody, it's uh, Darren Tipton back with VBAdrenaline.com and in the middle of the NCAA Volleyball Tournament, we are back with some more uh, bracket uh, conversation and today, uh, really excited, my first time meeting uh, Amy Pauley and she is the head coach of the Orlando Valkyrie of the Real Pro Volleyball League, but she also is a big commenter on the tournament, uh, former college coach and has a lot of opinions and a lot more more knowledge on the matches than I do. So we're going to bring her in and uh, coach, first of all, great to meet you. And thanks for hopping off the plane and hopping on with me today. Of course, any chance I get to talk volleyball, I'm, I'm always into it. So I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, absolutely. So I know you, uh, you've done a couple of these and, and read all your social media posts. Um, huge passion. College volleyball had been your life up until now. Just a uh, quick background. Do you have any biases of teams that you're pulling for? <laughs> <laughs> um, hmm, maybe a little. I, I was really rooting. For, I always cheer for my friends, first of all. So, and I, and I have some very dear friends in the volleyball community still coaching in every conference. And so I'm really, really lucky with the people that I've met through the sport. I was really cheering for USC. I thought that they had a shot against Pitt. I'm pumped to see JJ Van Neel and ASU going to the Sweet 16. And then for me personally, I played in the SEC. So I always have a little bit of SEC bias. I think it's been an underrated conference back then. And now it's just doing so awesome. And it's great to see those longtime coaches who I played against, which is crazy to think about um, having just the, the success that they're having. It's, it's been really fun to watch some of them. Yeah, I'm the same. You're probably a lot like me, and I don't have the vast college coaches, but it seems like the ones that I'm the closest to all got bunched up together. And so now um, we're, we interviewed Dan Besky with Louisville yesterday, and, and uh, Kellen at Pitt has been really good to be. And I'm like, oh, um, you know. It's like, how do you course, pick? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they put me on the spot on the bracket showdown, and I, I didn't hear the end of it. But I'm like, I literally do not. I want them both to win, but uh, my guys, uh, uh, you talk about the SEC, uh, Craig Skinner, and I've talked about this a lot. Uh, Craig and Anders, seven years ago, man, were so nice to be at a bit so good. So it's hard for me not to pull for them, but when you live where I live in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and Bergen Riley, it's uh, it's uh, hard enough to cheer for Nebraska. So that's a, that's yeah. another uh, conflict as well, but. Uh, um, yeah, it's, it's great for the sport. And it's, I thought it was so cool that selection Sunday, that there was so much buzz around it and things, there were actually arguments starting over player of the year and all conference and, and maybe that hasn't always happened in volleyball, but that's, in my opinion, that shows the growth that people are becoming more passionate about their fan, the fan bases and the game. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's kind of funny timing with everything that happened in football yesterday. You know, it, obviously that's on a, a much, much bigger scale, but I started to see those same types of conversations and complaints and joy and heartbreak in the volleyball community. And so I felt like when, when we start getting that and you start seeing that interaction happening on and the socials, it's like you're so close to just taking off. Like there's just more and more people caring and wanting to talk about it and, and have an opinion. So I'm I'm here for all of the the juicy tea and, and everything that's going on. I think it's it's really good for the sport. Yeah, it's great for the sport. And you talk about that uh, forever, you know, being the March Madness fan and grew up, I'm just a bracket geek. I tell people and I'll do anything with a bracket and, and, uh, but March Madness, you know, you always talk about bubble watch and whatnot. And um, one of the best players ever to come out of South Dakota, uh, Katie Fernholtz playing for Kansas state this year. And all of a sudden they were that team. And we had Katie lined up for an interview after the selection show and for the first time ever it hit like oh my goodness like those are real those are real people that are on that bubble that didn't make it right and in the fact that they showed their disappointment and people echoed in and chimed in it was good and bad uh, it was it was surreal uh during that time so i'm like i know her and i feel horrible for her yeah. and um but 
the discussion is what is uh what is cool about volleyball right now and there's only going to be more of it so let's jump in and get your expertise um on let's go to our first bracket so let's start with that number one overall seed uh so the lincoln regional and first of all just your thoughts on the opening weekend in lincoln nebraska i i mean i think nebraska did what they've been doing all season they they took care of business and so it was you know liu i I'm always so excited for those teams that get the opportunity to just be in the tournament, no matter who they're playing. And I always feel like they go out there and they, and they give it their best shot. So it's really fun to watch them and they get to play in front of these awesome crowds that they don't normally get to play in. And so it's great for them, but yeah, Nebraska just overpowers that whole bracket. Um, and again, really great to see Mizzou and Delaware who have been, haven't been in the tourney for a while. And so good for them, but Nebraska is just too good. <laughs> yeah. What, uh, what do you think not only about uh, Kentucky, the way they breeze through their half of the bracket, but the way they've played basically all dear, except the first weekend of SEC play, they've, they're a totally different team than they were early on. Yeah, they they're just hitting their stride at the right time. And that's what you always want, you know, as a college coach. And I'm sure, you know, I'll have this conversation with my professional team, but you want to be peaking at the right time. And that is exactly what Kentucky is doing. And I think a lot of people that doubted Skinner and doubted the players early on in the season are, are eating crow a little bit and I also think they didn't pay attention. I mean, they were missing Rutherford for quite a bit and having and to Rutherford. figure it out without her in, in the lineup. And so just don't bet against Craig Skinner. He is too good at what he does. And even if Reagan never came back this year, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they were still playing their, their best ball at the end of the year. It always amazes me that uh, people undersell that program. And I'm biased. I'm close to them, but uh, I'm close to them for a reason because how Craig does things. But uh, I'm like, people, uh, you realize that not a ton of programs have won a national title. Um, they're one of them. They should be in that conversation, you know, a brand name. And sometimes it just more often than not, they just tend to be overlooked. Yeah. No, I, I totally agree. Um, people like to give an asterisk to that national championship, but one can argue that it was the hardest time to win a national championship because the mental toll that COVID took on coaches, players, schools, like it's, they should absolutely be rewarded for what they did. And, and that is a feat for Skinner to do. So credit to him. Moving into this weekend, so they get the matchup with uh, with Arkansas. Um, you know, they uh, another SEC team. They're very common uh, common opponents. What do you think of that matchup uh, for Arkansas taking on Kentucky again? Um, let me turn my phone off really fast. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. <laughs> that is my hotel, and I'm sure they're trying to get in touch with me. But um, what if that was? What if that was a trade for a future first round draft pick? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, you know what? I hope they're calling my cell phone, not my hotel room, because that might be a little stalkerish if they really, <laughs> if they really. We could have had real pro that. volleyball breaking news right here. <laughs> You're the, uh, you heard it here first. Uh, no, I have I haven't had any trade proposals yet, so we'll see if that happens within the next week. But um, back to Kentucky and Arkansas, yeah. I I think Kentucky takes it. I think that they're just a little bit more physical. I know that Arkansas is polished. They defend, they serve and defend really well. Um, but I think right now, Kentucky, like I said, they're just, they're clicking at the right time. They have all the confidence and confidence in volleyball. It's, it's a game of runs. And so who can go back there and, you know, feel, feel their best. And I think Kentucky does that. What about Georgia Tech taking on the uh, the team to beat here in this tournament in their gym or arena? Yeah, I so I called Georgia Tech over Florida. Um, I was on a show last week on Sirius XM, and I you know I said I wanted it to be Mary's year, but with injuries, I just didn't really see it happening. And I Michelle is again another phenomenal coach. She's doing amazing things at Georgia Tech, but. Nebraska is just, they're too good. They got too many arms. 
They're the best defensive team in the country. And I think Georgia Tech is going to have a hard time scoring. As well. I, I And so we look at that potential matchup of Kentucky, Nebraska, one versus two. And in different ways, um, I, I think they play a lot the same. The defensive, uh, the defensive game of Kentucky, I think, is what's really turned around uh, the last couple months. They uh, the back row in ways. I, I think Eleanor Beavens um, is underrated on a national level. So good. So good. She's so fast. She has a great platform. I mean, you can give her half the court and she's going to get a hand on it. And then I think having Rutherford back, just a blocking presence in the front row helps too. So I, that game the first time was really exciting to watch. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I got to go with Nebraska still though, if it comes down to those two. I think the way they both play the freshman DS that play huge roles for both of them, very talented and will step in um, is simple. And uh, I think Kentucky's a much better, uh, a much better team, I think, than they were. Obviously, Nebraska has a lot more experience. Uh, just at the end of the day, I still think winning in Lincoln is is a tough task. Um, and they still have the more tournament experience, I guess, Kentucky, but uh, uh, the definitely be an interesting match. I don't think it'll be over quite as quick as it was uh, back in September, but uh, something to look for uh, forward to there in Lincoln and, and Craig Skinner going home to where, where it all started for him, I guess, uh, a few, few years ago, but uh, <laughs> one of my most uh, interesting and intriguing region, the Pittsburgh region, first of all, any surprises either with like Creighton, Minnesota or USC Pitt thoughts on the opening weekend in Pittsburgh. I'm not, I'm not surprised. Um, that hurts me to say I, cause I really do think that SC has the pieces. I think some of their, they've battled a lot of injuries this year, which I think a lot of people don't know about. Um, and unless you're probably close to the program, you don't know some of the hurdles that they've faced, but uh, Skyler is an amazing player. She absolutely can take over a match, but I think Fish did a really good job of scouting her, getting hands in front of her all the time on her D ball on the go. Even when she moved inside for a, a rip, I thought she did, you know, she, she still put up numbers, but they slowed her down. And when you slow her down and then nobody else is giving any more contributions, it's hard to beat a team like Pitt because they're too well-rounded. You know, they have two freshmen that are, are going off and then they have upperclassmen who have been there before, which is very different than the SC, SC team. Um, so I'm not worried about SC. I think they have some really good years ahead of them. Um, I was just bummed that they they didn't pull that one out, but really happy for Fish and that staff. Again, more more good people. There's so many good people in volleyball. Yeah, there, there really is. And, and the word I've used with them is just their grit and overcoming adversity. They've done it all year since the injury early on um, and didn't miss a beat. Man, preseason, they may have been one of the more dominating teams early in the season um, with something like 15 sweeps on the year. Um, so they've they've taken care of business. And those two freshmen did not show any nerves um, in the first weekend. So um, they're not playing like, like freshmen. How about, uh, talk about the Creighton-Minnesota match. Uh, that was intriguing to a lot of people. A lot of people were picking that as another upset, if you will. But Creighton took care of business just like they did early in the year. I think if you're an average fan, you picked Minnesota. If you are paying attention to volleyball and understanding these rosters a little bit more, I I went with Creighton all the way, um, especially with Sis back in the lineup and everybody healthy. I mean, if, if Sis isn't in, then we have an entirely different story. But that I can't imagine that Creighton team wasn't sitting there being like, wow, we finally have a healthy roster. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like it's our chance. Like, and we're home and we saw what happened to them the last couple of years. And I just think it was good karma for KBB. Like she was getting to the sweet 16 and I think they're really, really going to challenge Louisville. I am, I'm very excited for that match because I think that's two super gritty teams. They rely on their pins a little bit, but they, 
they take big swings and they get after it from the backcourt as well. And I just, I'm really excited to see that one. I have a hard time picking who the winner of that one is. And uh, again, Louisville, who played the very difficult non-conference schedule, had the the two great battles with Pitt um, during the year, um, but but also been a little bit a little bit up and down at times, um, you know, during conference play, and uh, you know, Creighton breeze through the big east maybe not quite the conference schedule um but a veteran team and a healthy team uh, both of those teams i think are coming in healthy um which wasn't the case with with either of them last year so yeah um what do you think about washington state tell me uh, a team that i don't know a lot about Washington State is the team that you never want to play. <laughs> they are so gritty. Jen Greeny and Burdett, they've just done a phenomenal job of putting that roster together. I mean, it's a, it's a senior-led team. They have been together. I think three of their players have not – four. Four of their players have – basically been playing together since they were freshmen. And then you add in Iman, the ASU transfer to just give another arm out there, but they are good and they don't want to lose and they'll do anything not to lose. And so they, they make it really, really hard to score. I can see them beating Pitt. Uh, if Pitt puts up the same offensive numbers on the pins that they did this past weekend, I thought a couple of their pins like statistically didn't do too hot. Um, and if Washington State's defense and block is on, I could see Pitt struggling. So I'm I'm gonna go with Washington State on this one. I think they they have the tools. And Magda is just so good. She's yeah. so good. Yeah. So you have a coin toss. Did you give did you give us a prediction on Louisville Creighton or did you oh. I'm going to go with Creighton. I, I'm going to go that they they just got a little extra chip on their shoulder this year. I think Kendra does a great job in the offense and is going to be able to really kind of establish a tempo. And move, she moves her hitters around a lot. And I think Kirsten KBB, the coach, is a really good scouter. And so Louisville, it, you can kind of pin them into only setting their outsides, which is why I think that they've lost a couple matches. And so if you can kind of scheme against them, which we saw them scheme against Minnesota, again, the average fan probably didn't see it so much, but she she pulled out a, a bag of tricks with that one. Um, and I, I could see Creighton with the upset. So the whole rematch rivalry that everybody was talking about on Selection Sunday, you're saying you're predicting neither of them uh, make it to the Elite Eight. Uh, just out of curiosity, if Pitt and Louisville would happen to meet up with each other, who would you like in that matchup? Ooh. I'm going to go with – I'm going to go with Louisville. And that they played the great five-setter in Pitt. Louisville yeah. won at their place. Uh, they're playing in the smaller arena on campus, so it will definitely be loud in there. So something to watch. And um, and interesting that you have a big shakeup there. So uh, I'm wondering if you'll have a shakeup in this next conf uh, this next regional, the Madison region. Uh, we'll talk about we might as well call it the Big Ten. Well, <laughs> if you want, we could call it the Big Ten tournament, but uh, but uh Talk about Madison opening weekend, the Penn State technically an upset over Kansas uh, and Hawaii opening round over Iowa State. Initial opening weekend thoughts from Madison. Um, out of Madison, um, you know, I was a little surprised you and I didn't play Miami tougher. I, I thought they were going to maybe win that one, but I think Miami's opposite is just too good. Uh, Wisconsin didn't surprise anybody. I see them going all the way to the final four here, uh, facing every team in this bracket. Um, I was bummed for Kansas. They put on a great season, great show. If you don't follow them, their attendance numbers are out of yeah. this world. Coach B and his staff are just really doing awesome things in Lawrence right now. And I, I love to see that for them. Um, and I was, I was surprised with how Penn State played against Yale. I was kind of thinking that it might be an easy matchup for Kansas, but uh, Coach Schumacher Cauley got it. They they were ready to go that night. Katie had them ready and they have veteran players too. And so I'm not surprised they won, um, 
but I was I was bummed for Kansas. I, I thought they were gonna to make it in. Hawaii against Iowa State. I don't know if I was the only person in the country that thought they would win that game, but I had Hawaii all the way. That again, grit. Like they just don't want to lose, and they find a way to win, whether it's through Amber in the middle or you know their pins turn it on when Amber isn't great, and so they just kind of find a way. Kate Lane does a really good job of balancing her offense and figuring out what's working for them, and. I, I think they just found that confidence against that Long Beach win in their conference tournament and took that right into the NCAA tournament. Um, and so I was really happy for them. I think they're a hard team to play. No surprises that Oregon took the match there. And I think Oregon versus Purdue is going to be really fun to watch. Um, Shacoin and Hudson, two great lefts for Purdue. And we'll see if that's what it takes against uh, Coiler and Gonzalez from, from Oregon. I think overall, Oregon might have some more pieces. Morgan Lewis is having a fantastic year on the opposite for the Ducks, but um, it could be a good one. I, oh man, who do I pick on this one? This one's hard. This one, this one's tough. <laughs> it's at work or it's at it's neutral site. So, mm. let me ask you: Does it does it hurt? Um, football, they talk all the time about flying across the country. Does it hurt a West Coast trip? Or are they there early enough? They acclimate to fly to the Midwest like this. I think it's easier going west to east than it is east to west, because when you're having that like seven o'clock match in the Midwest or the East Coast for those West Coasters, it just feels like four, four or five o'clock. But when you go the other way and you have to play a 7 p.m. match Pacific time, it's like 10 p.m. Oh. at home and it's it's a slow start. So we actually had this is a little bit of a tangent, but we had a sleep expert come in at USC last year to start talking to the coaches about what your travel would look like for the Big Ten and kind of tips and tricks for the student athletes. And and he even said he was like, hey, it's always going to be easier going going west to east. So don't complain too much because you're going to those other teams are going to have a hard time when they come out to the West Coast. It's interesting. Uh, Oregon was my um, big upset pick. Um, if anybody was going to knock off a one, they were my upset pick uh, over Wisconsin. But what you're saying, you think you think the Badgers are just too tough and too tough at home? Yeah, it, it's for me. It's them and Nebraska. I think that Wisconsin is so big at the net. They're just so it's hard to score, and you've seen that against almost every team they've played this year, you know, it's, it's hard to get by that block. And then they have, I thought chef has made some really cool defensive adju adjustments for his team this year stuff. I don't think anybody was expecting to see. And that just kind of shows to his creativity, but Orzel's done a great job as a libero. And uh, yeah, I, I think they're just hard to beat. So Wisconsin to the final four. Yeah, and and that is a definite home court uh, advantage that they built. Uh, they built it's loud, uh, it, it's large, it's loud. They have tradition, and probably a little bit, uh, you know, upset they didn't get back last year. And so, uh, just that little extra chip that they probably didn't need uh, <laughs> heading in, but that extra motivation if they needed, if they needed any. And then, uh, well, let's go on to the last, uh, the last region then, and uh, out in out at Stanford and. This is one I've told everybody I've talked to. I was a little surprised heading into the tournament. More people haven't talked about Texas uh, just because they're the defending national champions. They do have some veteran, you know, ballers on their team still. Mm -hmm. So they kind of have been, uh, I don't know if overlooked, but just not the A topic with Wisconsin and Nebraska doing what they're doing. Uh, what are your thoughts, first of all, on Texas opening weekend and then Texas heading into this weekend? I think Texas opening weekend was the same team that they've been all year. They are up and down. And I think that's probably why they're not getting talked about for national contention as much is just because we've seen them at some pretty low points, so to say this year. Um, but, you know, they handled SMU pretty good. The, the A&M match was really 
fun yes. to watch. I, I thought AM was going to push him to five and it was going to be, you know, one of those crazy, like what a future SEC matchup we had <laughs> that yeah. night. Um, I think the committee did that on purpose. Yeah, uh, we just couldn't wait. We couldn't wait uh, uh, <laughs> nine months for that rivalry to pick up. We just had to, we had to fast forward it and get it here yeah. now. But uh, uh, A&M's a program I'm really excited about, I think, going forward. But uh, um, I think they have a they have a bright future. But that was a great match uh, with them. Um, and they had, on the, had them on the ropes early, I guess, that first set. Uh, but just a little bit of a slow start. So the, the yeah. consistency, have they been playing better as of late? Um, was that a little bit more early in the year, mid-year? They had some of their ups and downs. For me, it's been all year. Um, you know, the Kansas State win wasn't yeah. that long ago um, right. at UCF. They played UCF. UCF played them pretty close, and they were they were up in two of the sets, and then just couldn't close out. You know, it's like they haven't been there before. They haven't been up on a top ten team before, so they didn't know how to close out. So, to me. Texas is kind of the same. I think they're good, has gotten better. So when they're playing their best, they look, yeah, they look like a, a national contender. But I think they're just, they don't have all the mojo going for them right now. Um, so we'll see if they can turn it on. I mean, again, another amazing coaching staff and they know what they're doing. So I'm sure they're training and they're scouting and they're doing all the right things that they're supposed to. And, and sometimes it's just at the hand of the players if they have it that night. And all of those kids are capable of doing it. I mean, they're a top recruiting classes in yeah. each year. So we'll we'll see. It's tough for freshmen. They have a freshman setter. And I know yeah. she's probably putting a lot of pressure on herself coming and taking over a, a fantastic team. And she'll, she'll figure it out, though. And uh, a match that I'm excited, um, I you know, I'm guessing you know Ellen Andrews, but Ellen just came from Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Yeah. So Ellen is the best. So not only uh, <laughs> JJ's doing great, but Ellen, a little South Dakota, uh, another South Dakota and doing big things. So I got to cheer for her. But co how cool has the ASU uh, run been this entire season? It's been so fun to watch. Like I've known JJ for several years now through my last boss at Villanova. So that's how I met JJ. And we've always been in touch mostly about recruiting stuff. And so, you know, he would call me and he'd say, oh, what do you think about this kid? And then I would call him and I'd say, how do you stat this thing? You know, I have no idea. And so <laughs> when we finally started working together, it was a, it was a great mix because we got a little bit of everything and i think we both learned a lot from each other and i can um i'm sure he won't mind me sharing this the the biggest thing he did this year with his team is get to know them and every week you know whether it was a, a coffee date or going out to lunch or just having a meeting in the office he he took the time all spring and when allowed in the summer and even this fall to just keep pouring into his players. And I, I think that was one of the biggest things he learned from being at SC and working for Brad too, who's such a relational person. And so his mind in the stats and the volleyball finally clicked, I think, with th this group of players because they were so invested in what he was doing because he was investing in them. And that why they're playing the way they're, pl they're playing, I think is a testament to, to what he's tried to do in creating a culture there. And so I'm so fired up for him. I, I think it's just going to continue. I know he's going to work hard recruiting and he's got a great staff with Ellen and Presley and everybody else surrounding them. And, and so I'm going to wish for ASU to win. That's my yeah. Well, and and they did. So they, they swept Stanford, which I think uh, surprised, uh, the entire volleyball uh, world, the way that they won early on. Uh, does that happen? Do they have that in, in them again? Is Stanford just too tough? W what's your uh, reaction on the Stanford ASU rematch? So I was actually at the Stanford ASU game at ASU. So I saw them sweep Stanford and I will tell you right now, it, ASU played great, but like that was not, it wasn't Stanford and they knew it. Like there was some things going on that was out of character and in a volleyball skill wise, not that they were being, you know, knuckleheads on the court or anything like missed assignments and bad, 
bad serves that just didn't really look like them. So I think this one's going to be much more of a dog fight. Um, they're different teams. Stanford is big. They serve hard. They rely on their block and they have a lot of arms. Don't get me wrong, but ASU is fast and scrappy and they'll try to fake you out. And I think Marta has established herself as the best opposite in the country. She is putting up ridiculous numbers right now. And the, the first weekend, I think she hit like over 500, which is insane because you went up against a SEC team that is on, you know, has continually shown growth every year. And then a BYU team who's con consistently top 20. And so for her to do that, I think Stanford's really going to have to have to shut her down. And if they can't find a way and she just keeps rolling, um, they're, they're going to be a hard team to beat. They both serve really, they serve and pass really well. So I think it's going to be tough. I'm, I'm going to go, go with ASU. I think they just got a little magic up their sleeve right now. You know, they're, they're rolling with something. You pick my kind of bracket. I like you. The, <laughs> the upsets, you yeah, upsets everywhere. So definitely not chalk with you. I like that. I like, I, that. I like you know, I've, I've always, I am a little gut, you know, you got to go with the gut every once in a while. Yeah. You can't do everything just by the numbers. Well, and, and I think it, br it brings up the entertainment value if, uh, you know, we have some shockers out there and uh, everybody doesn't chalk it to the final four. So I'm, I'm all for, I'm all for that. And like I said, I love, uh, love the ASU staff. I think it's been a great story. I would definitely be on board with cheering for that. Texas and Tennessee. Um, oh, by the way, Tennessee, who we haven't mentioned, uh, great opening weekend, a, a solid year in Rocky Top. What are their thoughts as we have another SEC preview match for next year? But what's your take on this one? I I have not watched Tennessee that much this year. I, I will admit that. Um, I know several of their players. Just um, my husband's from the D.C. area, and he coached in Metro. So he's had, you know, Fingal and Janasia Moore kind of come through that club. And so I'm, I'm familiar with them that way. But in general, I didn't know much about the team. When I watched them handle Western Kentucky, I was I was shocked. I was like, Eve has got that going over there. Because um, Western Kentucky, I mean, Travis, legendary coach. Their team is gritty. They always can, you know, swing themselves out of system and serve and pass. And I thought, you know, Tennessee did a really great job. So I, again, I'm, I'm going with Tennessee over Texas. I think that they have more balance in their offense right now. I, again, I think they have a team that's playing with a little bit of chip in terms of, you know, give us some credit. We've worked really hard for this. We want to prove you wrong. And everything that I've heard um, about just their team culture and where they're at and the work that they've put in, I think when the battles come their way, they're prepared for it. And so I, I know, you know, Morgan Fingal is going to have a great match and it's going to be a little bit up to their lefts if they can put up some decent hitting numbers. And uh, I think if they're both hitting, you know, over 150, then then we're in a good place. You obviously want them hitting better than that. But that just means they're, you know, at least sustaining throughout the match and letting some other people have some openings. Uh, what a uh, couple of real quick thoughts as we uh, as we get going here. And thank you so much for your time. But uh, uh, thoughts on we talked before we recorded uh, about job ESPN is doing with just the telecast, you know, so much more exposure, so much more excitement. Um, we, you know, there's been a talk about the, the championship game moving to Sunday on ABC, but in general, what do you think of the coverage of the tournament? Good and bad. I think probably like many people, um, it's great to have every game on ESPN plus, but it would have been even better to have some of those signature matches get on actual prime time or, you know, even like ESPN, you, you know, some of those matches were really, really good and really entertaining. So it was a little disappointing that we didn't get a single match over there. Um, I'm grateful that they're doing it. I love that we're on, you know, prime network for the championship. I think that's going to be so awesome. So many people are going to be watching and the more coverage, the better, because, you know, as you and I talked about, the more we get to see the personalities and, and not just the sport, that's how the game is really going to grow. Um, so 
Mixed reviews. How about that? <laughs> yeah, I think that's fair. Do you think, are, are we getting closer to having any kind of pregame show for volleyball or matches? Um, I know everybody talks it's a money thing, but I mean, you know, a college game day type um, atmosphere. Do you think there's, is that anywhere close with volleyball with a major network? I would say BTN probably would lead the way, but any thoughts of that? Yeah, I man, that would be awesome, especially in Madison or Lincoln, where those teams the or the the student sections they would definitely camp out for that. So I think you're onto something there. I can't see it happening anytime soon, um, but I would like to. Can we just we live? Can we go Facebook Live? Yeah, let, we should do that. <laughs> I got a MacBook, um, and I definitely have a winter jacket, so I could camp out for a couple hours. But oh, I, I'm I only get... going to the games in you know September. I I don't do the. I'm a Florida girl now, so I. <laughs> yeah, don't go to uh, Madison in, uh, in in December then. But just some with human interest stories in the game and and getting to know the stars better and it's more of a job. It'd be cool to see. That's to me. It's like we just turn on the match and then you know, it's over. There's no build up really for it and i hope i i hope uh somebody with a lot deeper pockets and imagination than me uh works on that because it would be neat to hear and learn more about these big matches like when we had the wisconsin nebraska match a couple weeks ago right uh volleyball fans building up um and especially like you said in in august with the preseason schedule the way it is might be might be something interesting but okay so we've all you you kind of made it sound like Nebraska versus Wisconsin on a collision course. All right. We're going to pick ahead. If those two meet up, who do you think wins the rubber match for the national title? Oh, it's going five for sure. <laughs> um, oh man, this, I, this is tough. I'm really having a hard time with this. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I think I I think I'm going to go with Nebraska. Yeah, I think that their serve and pass is just going to win out. They um explained to me with my low volleyball IQ but I but I love her cuz she's a South Dakotan. Explain what Bergen Riley is doing as a true freshman at a big time program. What's so special about the year she's put on for Nebraska being 18 years old? I think a lot of people will try to argue, oh, well, look, she has so many great hitters around her, but no one else is inside her brain except for herself. And so the fact that she's making the decisions when she is, her location from pretty much anywhere on the court is, it's really, really impressive that she has the guts to be, you know, 20 feet one way and jack a ball to to Harper or go back to Merritt on the on the right. And just that she has the confidence to be doing that. And she never looks like she's questioning herself. That's the biggest thing. I, I think she goes back there. She's got stone face. She knows when to celebrate. She knows when to not celebrate. And she has the respect of her team. And she is running that court. So to me, it's it's the mentality that she's playing with as, a, as an 18, 19. I don't know when her birthday is. But as a freshman, it's, yeah. that is, it's incredible. And literally on the world's biggest stage of volleyball. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Like, it's you don't want to compare players, but if we're talking about media coverage and stories, you know, you can kind of talk about her versus Swindle at Texas and, and how they're handling the the pressure a little bit differently. And again, I think I think Al Swindle will figure it out. She's extremely talented, but something about Bergen, that's why she's special this year is because she stepped in there in front of 8,000 fans who expect her to win a national championship and and she's doing it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, it's one of the many cool stories this year. Um, Amy, Paul, I thank you so much for talking brackets with us. Um, good luck on your inaugural season. We'll be hearing a lot more about the pro league and, and excited for that. And um, I'm guessing you got a couple more appearances here. Uh, just talking uh, 
talking Final Four coming up and enjoy the rest of the tournament, okay? I will. I, you as well. <laughs>